Welcome to this week's Money Meadows podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the low-cost precious metals dealer voted best in the U.S., Money Meadows Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, we dive into China with one of the foremost experts on the subject, Gordon Chang. Gordon shares his thoughts on the U.S.-China trade war and why he believes it's not likely to end anytime soon. Talks about the pending economic catastrophe he sees in China and the effects it's going to have on the global economy and, more importantly, for metals investors. You will not want to miss this incredibly in-depth and fascinating conversation with the man nearly everyone goes to these days for an explanation of what's really happening in China, Gordon Chang. Coming up after this week's market update. Gold and silver prices have been on the move again this week. The metals continue to serve as a safe haven from trade wars, currency wars, plunging bond yields, and stock market volatility. For the week, gold prices are up another 0.7% to bring spot prices to $1,509 per ounce. It's down a bit today and is looking to hang on for a weekly close above the technically important $1,500 level. With a few hours here left in the trading week, we'll see if it can do that. Silver's higher by 0.6% since last Friday's close to trade at $17.15. Platinum isn't faring too well, down $20 or 2.3% to come in at $845, but its sister metal palladium shows a weekly gain of 1.5% and currently trades at $1,450 an ounce. The Dow Jones Industrials, meanwhile, fell to a two-month low. When measured in terms of hard money, gold, the Dow actually fell to a two-year low. That puts it in bear market territory. Although they are up here today, stocks did get clobbered midweek on recession fears and interest rate abnormalities. On Wednesday, a critical part of the yield curve inverted for the first time since 2007. The yield on the benchmark 10-year U.S. Treasury fell behind the yield on the two-year note. When this particular inversion has occurred in the past, it has reliably been followed by a recession. In fact, a yield curve inversion has preceded each of the past seven recessions. The yield on the 30-year Treasury also inverted, in a sense, versus the Federal Reserve's 2% inflation target. For the first time ever, 30-year government bonds were sold this week with yields below 2%. In real terms, the entire yield curve may now be a negative territory. This week's Consumer Price Index report shows the core inflation rate rising at a 2.2% annualized basis. However, another inflation gauge the Fed relies upon, core personal consumption expenditures, has been running below 2%. That should give policymakers cover to pursue more aggressive stimulus measures in the months ahead. Pressure is now building on the central bank to get short-term rates down and get them down fast. Another quarter-point cut may be viewed as inadequate by jittery investors and a frustrated president of the United States, who continues to bash Fed Chairman Jerome Powell on a daily basis. Even though Congress is on its summer recess, political risks are weighing heavily on markets. If it's not President Donald Trump's Fed tirades and trade wars, it's the radical socialistic proposals from 2020 Democrat candidates and the bipartisan deficit spending splurge on Capitol Hill, that has investors concerned. Senator Rand Paul has warned of a coming day of reckoning. They're fiscally irresponsible. Who are they? Republicans. Who are they? Democrats. Who are they? Virtually the whole body is careless and reckless with your money. So the money will not be offset by cuts anywhere. The money will be added to the debt and there will be a day of reckoning. What's the day of reckoning? The day of reckoning may well be the collapse of the stock market. The day of reckoning may be the collapse of the dollar. When it comes, I can't tell you exactly, but I can tell you it has happened repeatedly in history when countries ruin their currency. Senator Paul recently underwent surgery to have part of his lung removed. It had been damaged as a result of a 2017 attack by a deranged neighbor that left him with six broken ribs. The injuries could have been fatal. Yet the attacker, who had left a trail of social media postings calling for political violence, barely even got a slap on the wrist. A federal court sentenced him to a prison term of only 30 days. Even as our criminal justice system often lets violent criminals get off easy, 
Many politicians want to preemptively punish Americans who exercise their Second Amendment rights. Lawmakers are currently devising new gun control measures to be put up for a vote after they return to Washington in September. Yes, the same Congress that can't control its spending may soon move to control and restrict your access to firearms. In theory, it would make all the sense in the world to disarm bad guys before they can carry out shooting rampages. In practice, heinous acts such as these are difficult to predict or prevent. Lone wolf perpetrators with no prior criminal histories can often pass background checks, and career criminals will always find ways to obtain guns illegally. It's predominantly the good guys, the law-abiding gun owners, who would get disarmed by new gun control laws. Gun rights advocates are concerned that the political tide may be turning against them. The National Rifle Association is in disarray and no longer wields the influence on Capitol Hill that it once did. If you're a proud gun owner or Second Amendment advocate, you may be interested in adding some silver bullets to your investment portfolio. Yes, you can own silver bullion in the form of replica bullets and shells. They won't actually fire, but they could become hot commodities as silver prices rise. Money Metals Exchange now offers replica bullets made of solid .999 pure silver in a variety of sizes, commemorating the right to keep and bear arms. The bullets also honor the timeless value of precious metals as real money. You can join both fundamental values together by adding your choice of our beautiful silver bullets to your metal stash. Our .999 fine silver bullets come in five popular sizes from one ounce up to 25 ounces each. Our one ounce silver bullet is modeled after the 45 caliber round of the famed Colt 45, the two ounce after the 308 rifle round, the five ounce after a 12 gauge shotgun shell, while the 10 ounce is modeled after a 50 caliber Browning machine gun. And the impressive 25 ounce bullet is a replica of a 20 millimeter cannon round. A bullet represents the power to uphold justice, stop a threat, and protect your life and property. Owning silver can help you fight the injustice of the Federal Reserve System, mitigate the threat of inflation, and protect your personal wealth. Collect them, display them, and use them to start a conversation about two vital American traditions, the right to keep and bear arms and honest money. Choose your favorite or grab a few of each to add to your personal arsenal of precious metals. Well now, without further delay, Let's get right to this week's exclusive interview on the hot news topic of the moment, that being China, with a man who is as knowledgeable as anyone on the subject. It is my privilege now to welcome back Gordon Chang, author, television pundit, and columnist. Gordon's a frequent guest on Fox News, CNBC, and CNN, among others, and is one of the foremost experts on Asian economics and geopolitics, having written books on the subject. And it's great to have him back on with us. Gordon, it's a real honor to have you on again. And thanks so much for the time today. I know you're a man in high demand these days, given your expertise on Asia and China in particular. And I really appreciate you coming on to talk to us. How are you? I'm fine. And it's a real honor for me to be on your podcast. So thank you very much, Mike. Well, trade tensions with China have been one of the big stories in the financial press for the past year and a half we have seen U.S. equity markets gyrate up and down. One day, traders are euphoric on rumors that a deal with China will soon be reached. The next day, they're depressed over news of escalating tariffs and some other negative developments. Most recently, we saw a big rally in the stock market on the announcement that some tariffs will be delayed by a few months, although with the further inversion of the yield curve here today, the day we're talking Wednesday, the stock market is giving pretty much all of that back. Uh, but that aside, I'd like to start by getting your assessment of the prospects for a trade deal here, Gordon. Do you think we're going to see these tensions resolved in the next few months? Uh, certainly not. Uh, I don't see a comprehensive trade deal until 2020, maybe 2021, maybe never. Problem is, Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, doesn't necessarily want a deal. He owns this trade war, quote-unquote, and if he makes significant compromises, he's going to accept the political responsibility for that. You've got to remember that uh, accumulating great power is, of course, an advantage, but it means he also accumulated great accountability. He can't blame other people. So I think that the Chinese political system right now is pretty much frozen, and that means we're not going to see a comprehensive deal, probably not even going to see an interim arrangement either. 
President Trump has been confident that the U.S. has the upper hand in trade negotiations. He believes China needs the U.S. more than we need them. Frankly, we don't know if the president's assessment factors in America's largest export to China, that being U.S. dollars. We export an awful lot of inflation to China and might be ignoring the vast quantities of U.S. Treasury debt they hold. So it appears as though China does have some leverage here. Uh, there is also some political leverage. They certainly know how eager the president is to avoid a recession between now in the 2020 election. On the other hand, it would be hard to overestimate how important exports to the U.S. are to the Chinese economy. What are your thoughts about who is holding the stronger hand here? The United States has the upper hand. You look at all the metrics, and they point in our direction. So first of all, we've got the larger economy. Last year, we produced $20.5 trillion of gross domestic product. China claimed $13.82 trillion, but that number is probably exaggerated. Also, we don't have a trade-dependent economy. Everyone wants the U.S. market. And indeed, China is dependent on us. They're the trade surplus country. And we know from history that it's the trade surplus countries that get hurt in trade wars. And China is extraordinarily dependent on us. Last year, China's merchandise trade surplus with the U.S. accounted for 119.3% of their overall merchandise surplus. That gives us enormous leverage over Beijing. And by the way, Mike, we've got a robust economy. We grew 2.1% in the last quarter. China, who knows what they grew, but probably half of what we did at best, and they could have even been contracting. The numbers from China, especially the last couple months, the underlying indicators look particularly gruesome. So overall metrics, we've got them. The only issue is political will. And people think that Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, has got more of it than we do. President Trump is doing a pretty good imitation of someone who thinks he's got political will. So I think for the moment, we can say that the U.S. is going to be safe. There's going to be a lot of squawking, but Trump doesn't seem to care too much. And long term, we we're just in the uh, position where we can push the Chinese around. All we have to do is realize that we can do it. Certainly Trump has built up a lot of his credentials as a successful businessman, as a good negotiator. So obviously we do have to keep that in mind. Uh, do you envision China continuing to devalue their currency or, or starting to dump dollars to hurt the U.S. bond market? Do you see them pulling something like that? Or will they just talk about that and use that as a threat, as a negotiation tactic, but won't actually follow through? What are your thoughts there? I'm not particularly worried about China dumping U.S. Treasury obligations to hurt us. Because we got to, first of all, remember, they've only got, what, $2 trillion at most in, in a very big and liquid market. But also, just think about the way the dynamics of the markets work. You know, 100% of our obligations are denominated in dollars. So the Chinese are going to get dollars. And then they've got to put them into other currencies in order to hurt us. You know, euros, pounds, yen, whatever. And which means that Brussels, London, and Tokyo have got to go out in the global markets to bring their currencies back down in value because they're going to soar when the Chinese buy them. So these central banks have got to rebalance their currencies, and the only way they can do that is to buy dollars. You know, the Chinese have been talking about the nuclear options since the middle of 2008, but they never do it. And the reason they never do it is because they know it won't work. Getting back to the Chinese economy, over the years, it has been really hard for U.S. investors to get an accurate picture of what is really happening. We've all heard about the massive economic growth there, but then there are conflicting stories. We hear that growth is artificial. Many ghost cities have been built, and China's economy is a massive bubble which could pop any time. Uh, you've been one of the strongest voices warning of troubles ahead over there. Recently, you appeared on Fox News and noted the Chinese are doing, quote, some things which smell desperate. Can you share with our listeners what you're seeing there? Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at, for instance, the numbers from June and July, they show imports consistently down month after month, and that shows weak demand. Car sales, which are bellwether, they were off for 13 straight months in July. You know, you're starting to see, for instance, urban unemployment increase. And, and some of these numbers, which are supposed to be strong, aren't. So, for instance, the purchasing managers' indices for the manufacturing sector have been flashing negative, both the official one and the unofficial one. 
Industrial output in July was very low, the lowest in about 17 years or so, something like that. So we're seeing an economy right now that is in trouble. You go back, for instance, to December of last year. You had a professor at Renmin University in Beijing. He created a sensation across China when he said, look, the economy in 2018 is going to grow no more than 1.67%, may even contract. Now, Beijing reported 66 for the year, but they're not acting as if they've got an economy growing that fast. And, and by the way, even if they were growing 66 they're creating an amount of debt, which is about five and a half times more than they're producing nominal GDP. They can do that for a little while because they control borrowers, lenders, courts, everything, but they can't do that for very much longer. So I think that they realize they're in trouble right now, and they just don't know how to get out of it. So when their default position is to just sort of spend more government money, but with the debt accumulating the way it is, I don't think that they can do that for too much longer. We've recently seen demand rising for gold and silver, including physical bullion. There are a number of reasons. Some good price performance is helping, but some of the demand is coming from investors who are increasingly skeptical about the U.S. equity markets, the dollar, and even bond prices. As we've discussed, the trade dispute with China is one of the wild cards. Another is the risk that the Chinese economy will falter. Back in the summer of 2015, when the Chinese market was plummeting, it was a very rough time for stock markets all over the world. So we have some recent history to go on there as to how important the Chinese economy can be to the rest of the globe. Uh, so let's talk about that one. What do you think it will mean for the U.S. if the bubble in China finally does pop, Gordon? I think people are going to be taken by surprise. I don't think they should, but they will be because markets do believe that China is growing somewhere close to the reported numbers. But we're starting to see a rush to safe havens, and especially the 10-year Treasury. People want it, and that's a real sign that there are problems in the global economy. And, of course, China is going to exacerbate that. So I think long term, I would imagine that there's going to be a flight to safe haven. And when the Chinese economy does hit the wall, it's going to be very good to be in 10-year treasuries in gold and other safe haven assets. Well, as we begin to close here, Gordon, any final comments that you want to leave us with today? And I, I didn't ask you much about uh, North Korea, so maybe give us your thoughts on the developments there and other geopolitical theater that you're going to be watching over in Asia in the coming weeks and months that investors might want to be thinking about and keeping an eye on. I think the most important thing in terms of geopolitical developments in Asia to watch in terms of effect on financial markets is going to be the situation in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is irreplaceable as a city, but we're seeing hardening of attitudes on both sides. You've got not only the pro-democracy kids, but you've got a big portion of the Hong Kong population, at least two-thirds, maybe three-quarters, that are supporting the kids because they believe that this is the last stand for autonomy. And because of that hardening of attitudes, I think you're going to see both sides take positions that probably are going to end up shaking not only the Hong Kong markets, but global markets as well. North Korea, at least for the moment, is the sideshow. Hong Kong is where we really need to look to get our clues to where things are going. Yeah, obviously, a lot of us have seen uh, what happened there uh, this week, uh, just on our TV set, some of those riots in Hong Kong. Uh, just lastly, uh, what's your take on that? And do you think we're going to see more of that sort of thing as the unrest grows? You know, normally you would think that demonstrations would just sort of lose their vigor and they sort of melt away, which is what happened in 2014 with the Occupy protests. But these protests have been actually going on since April. We're now in our 11th straight week, and they show no sign of stopping. And it's because I think people believe that this is the last stand. So there's going to be difficulties ahead. I don't think that uh, Beijing is going to deploy the People's Armed Police or the People's Liberation Army into Hong Kong, at least until after October 1st, which is the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic. But sometime after that, I'd be very worried that China is going to do exactly that. And by the way, Mike, we have video evidence suggesting that mainland police officers or mainland army soldiers are actually on the Hong Kong streets right now dressed in Hong Kong police uniforms. So, for instance, from about a week ago, there's this video of a Hong Kong riot policeman who's obviously from Hong Kong because he's speaking colloquial Cantonese. 
But then he turns to other riot policemen near him and starts speaking to them in Mandarin, which wouldn't happen if those other guys were from Hong Kong. And indeed, he addresses them as comrade. So there's a suggestion, which I think is pretty solid, that China's already deployed. And so this is a situation which is going to get extremely emotional, and it's going to last a long time. Very interesting developments and good catch there. That's going to be something to keep an eye on. And yeah, maybe we're witnessing the last stand there. As you mentioned, this could be quite interesting. Well, Gordon, it's been another fascinating conversation, and we can't thank you enough for sharing with us uh, your incredibly studied view on the state of things in China and in Asia. We're very fortunate to have you fill us in and, and give us your perspective, given what's going on of late and your incredible expertise in that area. And we hope to check back with you again in the future as we learn more about how this will play out and, and get your comments again. But in the meantime, take care and enjoy the rest of your summer. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to Gordon Chang. You can follow him on Twitter, at Gordon G. Chang, or check out his book, The Coming Collapse of China. And check back here next Friday for our next weekly Market Wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes for answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds. Call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.